Welcome back to Hoops Lounge, where the show that's easier to pronounce than Giannis Antetokounmpo. My name is Mark Griffin, a.k.a. Montreal Mark. That was not an easy one. I'm joined by Sporting Phil, Phil Ballot, and Justin Rowan. Cavzana, we're going to talk madness because it's March. Let's start with Ben Simmons, who's the projected number one pick in the NBA draft this year. Uh, academically ineligible for the John Wooden Awards, not even participating in the March Madness Tournament. The big issue, I think, if you look at the big picture, is this one-and-done philosophy. The system seems to be broken, if not shattered. Justin, I'll go to you first. What do you do with guys like these superstars like Ben Simmons wanting to go to the NBA? I, I think people need to get creative when they're coming up with solutions. I, I don't think any of the models in the past have been the best way to go about it. I think what's really important for the NBA and Adam Silver is to expand the D-League to have a complete minor league system that players could either opt to go into the NBA draft, and if they're not ready, they develop in the D-League. You can call them up, similar to how hockey does it. But then if you commit to college basketball, you have to commit for a certain amount of years. I don't know if you want to make that two or three years, but I think that would improve the college basketball product because guys that want to get that education, are able to get that education. Uh, they're able to develop in that way, and once they're done, they can enter into the draft. Or if some of these guys are just ready to play in the NBA, like we, we look at LeBron James, um, Dwight Howard, guys that were really ready to go pro right off the bat, they can go into the NBA, they can opt for that route, and if they still need some time to develop or if they, they need to fine-tune some te things, teams can send them down to the D-League. So I think a system like that would be the best way to go about it, but the infrastructure has to be in place before they make that change. Phil, what's your take? Honestly, I mean, it, it's an interesting play, right? Because I think making them go to college, it kind of feels like they're just perpetuating the NCAA money-making machine. It's kind of like, here, come to us for a year so we can make a lot of money off you. I mean, I know I've, I, I have a bit of a sour look on the NCAA in, in a lot of ways. Um, when you look at Ben Simmons, obviously, academically, he, he was not going to be one of those guys who sticks around for two, three, four years to get his degree. I mean, he barely wants to show up to anything or... You know, so he's one of those guys who wants to go to the NBA. My, I think I agree with most things that Justin's saying, but my counterpoint would be, you know, if you have a guy who goes into the NBA right away from high school, and then you have this other guy who goes four years collegiate system, well, obviously we all know that how the salary brackets play out. Once you're off your first four-year contract, you're eligible for more money, more money, more money. So what you're basically saying, in in my eyes, is that some guy who chooses to to go to the Duke or a Syracuse or whatever and get his degree, he's going to come out three, four years later with the degree, which is cool, but the reality is the degree is more of a backup plan, right? I mean, if they're, mm -hmm. stick, if they're sticking around the league for 10 years, the money they make off their degree afterwards, I mean, like, it's great that Pau Gasol is a, a surgeon or a doctor, but I mean, like, he, he's making way more money with the Bulls, but at the same point, you know, you have to kind of reward the guys who choose to go to university and say maybe we'll bump up that pay scale if you choose to do that because guys just for the money will come in out of high school be like, hey, I want to get my rookie contract done as soon as I can to start making that first real contract, then the second one, and turn into the Kobe world. I mean, look how much money Kobe Bryant's making because he got in at 17, right? Mm -hmm. And if he had come in you know, at 22 he would be pushed back. Like, he wouldn't be making $25 million at this point. I mean, you know, that's all salary cap dependent and where that goes up and down. But I think to do that, I think it would go hand in hand with the NBA saying, okay, we want to promote our players being, you know, more intelligent, educated, you know, work through those systems. But at the same point, we want to reward a guy uh, like a Tim Duncan who spends a few years monetarily in the NBA uh, by saying, you know, your bracket now gets pushed a bit by maybe years of service or a degree. Like maybe if you graduate and, you know, it may be a little dicey how they push degrees like they did for Shaquille O'Neal, but, um, you know, I, I still think that matters. And um, Yeah, my, my thing with that is, like, if you're going to college, like, I think that's a decision players and people are able to make for themselves. And if you're going to college, if you're going that route, it's because you don't feel you're ready for the NBA. So you're developing that skill set. And maybe because of that development uh, at that level, um, you get drafted higher and you make more money. Like, look at Russell Westbrook. He spent two years in college. He was drafted uh, by Seattle. 
Um, and it took him two, three years in the NBA before he latched on. If he came straight out of high school, those four years of being raw and not a very good player might see him out of the league. He would have been drafted mm-hmm. lower, so he's not making as much on his rookie contract. And he sure isn't getting the max after that rookie deal because he didn't latch on and he didn't show, he didn't have that solid footing to eventually build off of. So I think it'd be obviously, like, I, I get where you're coming from, but I, I think that's that's a decision players are able to make and they have to evaluate where they're at with their skill set. Damian Lillard, another good example, someone that needed that college experience for a couple of years before he could make that leap to the NBA. Uh, CJ McCollum as well. But if they yeah. know they can spend the time in the D-League and that still counts towards their NBA contract, isn't that the same thing? Just why go to university? Uh, well, here's something we, we have mm-hmm. to bring up is the injury issue, right? There's always that what if. Like, what if I get break my leg or whatever while I'm in college? Phil, yeah. do you think there should be some kind of insurance policy in place, especially for the bigger name players? I mean, like, like right away when you say that, I mean, I was thinking, uh, you know, way back in the Yao Ming draft, Jay Williams. I mean, obviously he didn't get hurt playing. Uh, it was a motorcycle accident. But, like, I think it's going to happen that players are able to take, uh, you know, career insurances out. out. I, I don't think that's a strange thing at all, especially the higher picks. Um, but, I mean, you know, those injuries can happen wherever you are in the D League or in college. I just think if I'm a player and I think I'm good at all, I don't, I don't, I don't see the reason at all why I would ever go to college and spend mm-hmm. time there, not be paid, and have to deal with presumably worse competition than go to a D League, even if I'm not ready, be paid way more money, get chance to be called up, play against way better competition, and presumably have better systems and I think that growth would happen more I mean in the collegiate Mm -hmm. system it's a lot based on coaches styles you know are you being put into the Princeton system or this system whereas in the D-League I mean outside of Sacramento's D-League you're playing a legit NBA style basketball I don't like and Mm -hmm. go back to university after with all that money I I don't see why any any player would go to university instead of going to the D-League if that was the choice well, I, I think it would. I think it would be an option for those that aren't a hundred percent sure if they're going to make it in the NBA. Like, sure, let's say sure. Draymond Green, for example, who had to spend the four years under Tom Izzo, and like you'd be going for like kind of a way to hedge, because you you get the degree, you'd have that plan B. Because really, when you think of how many players are in the collegiate system, how many great athletes, guys that were the best player on their team growing up or their AAU team. Um, that don't make it into the NBA. It gives you that plan B. You get to go uh, with these uh, all-world coaches, uh, Tom Mizzo, Krzyzewski. If you're not uh, guaranteed, uh, maybe a first-round draft. Um, I get that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it wouldn't be for those guys that are bona fide, like, first-round talent. Okay. And so we have we mentioned Plan A and Plan B, but there's also a Plan C. There's guys like Emmanuel Mounier who went over to China to play. Phil, do you recommend something like that? Emmanuel Mounier, Brandon Jennings. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say no because as as well as they did um, when we looked at the draft last year, a lot of criticisms were made on Mounier that it wasn't real NBA competition. Um, I don't think playing in a league that that doesn't resemble the NBA benefits you more than like like I, like I think in a lot of ways the collegiate system represents better than a lot of these international leagues. I mean, sure you make may make a little bit more money, but but a lot of times they're just like supremely the best player on weak competition. Like like sometimes it's not the case. Like I totally get that. Uh, like I'm not trying to say the other leagues are terrible or anything, but for me, if I'm coming out of the draft, I want to showcase my talents. And if I'm not doing that against legit NBA competition, I don't know why I'm doing that. Um, so I, I, I guess I just don't really see it. I think people did that because the D League idea that you guys are referring to didn't exist. I think if the mm-hmm. D League did did, it, did exist, I think going overseas, like like look, if you don't get drafted in the first three years, then go. Like why go before, right? So yeah. I don't know. I just I, I think it would replace uh, the overseas uh, brain drain there. Justin, and the think? other thing is, oh, uh, I was ahead. just going to add, uh, just quickly add that there's a human element to that too. If you're 17, 18 years old, you're playing in a strange country, you've never been there, you don't have family there, presumably you're making money. I, I mean, I don't think that's a choice that's built for every personality. 
Yeah, and and Phil, I mean, I'll throw the last question to you. Do you think kind of what the Raptors are doing, having their D-League team basically in their own city, having Bruno Caboclo there, nourishing him, developing him, you know, close to home, do you think that's the ideal model to have? Well, look, uh, to preface this, I'm going to have to take uh, my Bruno homerism and put it on the side. Um, <laughs> but I think it, it makes sense. I think the idea that you can spend time with the big team, that you can, you know, uh, uh, the way Justin uh, prefaced it before, comparing it to the NHL is perfect. I mean, you know, uh, being here in Montreal, I see this happening with the Montreal Canadiens all the time, and it works. Uh, you get guys who come up for two games, go down, and they get amazing experience, they get to tr train with real players. I think guys like Bruno needed a situation like that. I think throwing him into the NBA right away, as much as I would have liked to see him, I think would have been setting him up for failure. And I th I don't I just think it's a perfect situation. I think every team should have their own D-League team that works exactly kind of like how Justin described it starting off the show. And I think you could really monetize that as the NBA. You could use that as a training ground. You could sell tickets. You could, like, like uh, these are more ways to market your sport. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one on done, and we're going to move on because there's so much more to cover than just the college game right now. Uh, the New York Knicks. Kamal Anthony was asked about waiving his no-trade clause potentially this summer, the Knicks, if they don't get a top free agent. And he said, SHI expletive, I don't know if I'm going to be on this team any longer. Justin, what's going on with the Knicks? I don't know, man. There's, there's so many rumors and theories running around it. Um, one that I've heard is because Frank Isola and a few other people had said that there was a three-team deal, Cleveland Cavaliers, Boston Celtics, and the New York Knicks. And Carmelo would have had to waive his no-trade clause, but basically Kevin Love ends up in Boston. Uh, Boston sent some players and picks to, to Cleveland, or I, I think Melo goes to Cleveland, and Boston sends another player along with him. Um, and then people were speculating that LeBron, who was tweeting about somebody making mistakes and having to live with it, was actually directing that at Carmelo. Now, hmm. Carmelo seemed like a much different person after the deadline, so maybe there was some truth to those rumors. Maybe Melo was going to go to Boston. I don't know what the the actual uh, foundation of that deal was. Um, but maybe there's something there. Um, my mind keeps going back to Woj in the summer of 2014 when Carmelo signed that deal. He said the thinking in Carmelo Anthony's camp was get the $126 million from New York and you can always force a trade later. So if I had to speculate, I don't think Carmelo is going to be in New York uh, when all is said and done uh, at the end of this summer. Phil, where is he going to be? Listen, I'm trying to read through the tea leaves. Uh, a couple other side kind of um, articles here. We saw Kurt Rambis saying how he'd like to try Kristaps Porzingis at the three, which is where oh Carmelo God. plays. Right? No, no. I mean, I don't think it's a good idea either. But he, you know, he's saying his athleticism, his agility, blah blah blah. I don't think he should do it either. But you know, those are positions. Like, is Kristaps the, you know, the heir apparent to Melo? Um, I thought in 2014 <laughs> it was a huge mistake him not signing in Chicago. Um, uh, yes. to, be, to be very honest. Um, but I think between that and Phil Jackson and the Laker rumors, um, there's a lot of movement there. And I don't. I I think part of them have, have said have said like you know as much as we love Carmelo Anthony, he's a New York guy for life. I don't think they think they can win with Carmelo Anthony. Um, and I think they're looking at Kristaps Porzingis, be like, listen, we know we have a stud here. We don't want to poison this. Bring something else in and rebuild but still stay fun and competitive. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I think um, they're playing their... I don't, I don't know if they're playing their cards right. I don't know how much value they're going to get compared to a, you know, like what Denver got when they fleeced the Knicks for them. Um, oh, it was such a good deal. But and the Knicks could have just waited till the summer. The Knicks could have just waited till the summer. And the Knicks don't want to wait for anyone. James Dolan wants things now. Um... But yeah, I think he's gone. I think the Cleveland uh, trade should have happened. I think um, all in all, I would have really liked, although it would have forced uh, LeBron to play his dreaded power forward maybe. Um, <laughs> but at the same point, I think he needs to get out of there. I can see him in a lot of different teams. I just think it's as much he wants to get out of there, but I think he's reading the tea leaves too. I think the Knicks are maybe wanting to go into a less like we feel pressure to win right now and we want to build this properly mode. Yeah. Justin, who's coaching that team next year? Oh, man, that is a great question. Um, <laughs> it should be Kurt Rambis, I'll say that. Um, 
And, Phil, you, you mentioned not being able to win with Carmelo Anthony. I don't think the Knicks are ever going to win with James Dolan. Uh, yeah. I think that's the biggest problem there. You can't trade uh, Dolan, right? No, you can't. You can't. Um, and, uh, unfortunately for Knicks fans, that I think they're just in a terrible position because of that. Um, God, if I had to guess who... It, it depends if Phil Jackson stays. Like you, you never know what Phil's going to do, and if he wants to keep running the triangle, I'm sure they're going to make a big push for Luke Walton. Um, Phil offered to coach home games next year, which if the so organization awkward. is as big of a disaster as people perceive it to be, that's going to happen, which would just be amazing uh, from a comedy standpoint. But um, I, I think Luke Walton would be a good candidate there. Um, if they were smart, I think they'd go after Tom Thibodeau. Uh, Thibodeau has said like he he would basically like kill his mother to like coach the Knicks. Like yeah, that's his absolute dream. So or David Blatt Thibodeau's maybe with like, a Euro connection with Kristaps. Uh, I you know what I don't I don't see Blatt landing a coaching job just yet. I, I think he will probably after next season, but I think there needs to be some breathing room there, especially with all the talk of players not connecting with him. That's that's always tough in the NBA, but um, I think Thibodeau, Luke Walton would be the best candidates that I can see, at least right now. Maybe Scott Brooks. Phil, I mean, you were talking about building around Porzingis, uh, either at the three or the four spot. If you were the GM, Phil Jackson, the squad, who would you bring in to compliment uh, Chris Stops? You know what, honestly, um, I would, well, it depends what you can get for Mello, but I think a guy like uh, Nick Batum actually would look really nice next to him. I really like Robin Lopez. Uh, like, I know we've heard all these Dwight Howard to New York, he wants to go to New York rumors, but I don't know if I'd rock the boat like that. I don't know if I really want Dwight Howard next to Kristaps. Like, like he's my little gem uh, that I want to, you know, polish nicely and have him turn into a real star. Like, I really like Robin Lopez. I, like, I feel like he's been a really underrated center his entire career. I feel mm -hmm. like I, I feel like the Pelicans regret uh, trading him for nothing and not having him next to Anthony Davis right now. I think he really made Lamarcus Aldridge in a large way mm -hmm. in Portland, and I feel. With everything he brings to the table, I like that. Um, a Flalo, he might opt out because he's be being paid, you know, very little compared to what he could. They need a point guard. Um, I mean, really, they need someone to lead this team. I mean, from a point guard standpoint, so it depends. Yeah. Like, like we're talking free agents. I don't think there's some big names. Like, I wouldn't really rock the boat with any big guys who are going to steal attention. I, I think a guy like Nick Batum is really smart, and if you can trade. Mellow for someone to shore up your point guard position. I think that looks good. Mm -hmm. Justin, I, yeah. next year, I mean, what what's the one thing you would change for these guys besides James Dolan? Uh, point guard would be a big one. I think going after Mike Conley in free agency would be good. Uh, real equal opportunity point guard. A veteran uh, plays good defense. I think in terms of a fit next to Porzingis, I don't know if Phil would agree with this, but I think long-term I'd love to see uh, Porzingis play at center. Um, I think <laughs> Robin Lopez is a great fit for the time being. Uh, but being able to play five out, uh, I think he does have a lot of defensive potential, uh, someone that can space the floor and have a defensive impact almost like an Ibaka. And if you could have two of those guys, even an Ibaka would be great next to him. Um, and just play a five-out spacing offense, have a point guard like a Conley that can really distribute the ball, make sure everyone's getting their touches. Um, you can almost mimic what Golden State does with its death lineup where everybody can hit the three except with real size, which I, I think is really exciting. Well, and I think that's the way to pull uh, Kevin Durant from OKC and pull that front court. Oof. Not going to happen. <laughs> maybe, gonna happen. maybe. The wheels are turning okay. in the trade world. <laughs> okay, so we're going to jump ahead. Um, so I've spoken a lot about how Golden State is a, an amazing, amazing team, and one of the keys to their run last year in this has been their health. And the antithesis to what Golden State has been doing has been the Memphis Grizzlies, who, oh. if you re rewind a year ago, they were actually second in the West, Okay. And right now they've got two D-leaguers in their starting lineup who I don't even know who they are. Basically, their their entire core is injured out long term. Phil, what do you think of the Grizz and their basic JV team right now? 
I think it's more than that. I think what's interesting about this, like you're seeing guys like Matt Barnes, you're seeing guys like Lance Stevenson, who, who like I kind of called, is doing a little better than we thought. Um, but I think the, the weird part about this team is it kind of scares me that they're not afraid to be really rough and tough. Like I think they just real like like how it feels to me is like those picked on people who've just been put into a corner and they're just like, well, we don't have the stars to win, so let's just go hurt. Like like it kind of feels like the Patrick Beverly team. Like I feel that I don't like Boston is a weird comparison because, you know, like like they went through hustle, they went through, you know, camaraderie, they went through a lot of things, but there's something dangerous about the Grizzlies that I think I like I don't want this kind of a squad to exist past this year because I think it can actually be dangerous for a lot of teams going forward. Not not in a way of actually play on the basketball court of just dumb plays, aggressive, overly aggressive plays because they have nothing to lose, right? There's a lot of there there are a lot of players on this team that are not going to be getting these minutes next year, and you know they feel like they've got the short end of the stick in terms of injuries, in terms of people counting them out. I'm I'm not a fan of these Grizzlies for the NBA this year. I'll, I'll put it lightly that way. Justin, would it be fair to call them a wounded bear? I definitely would, would call them a wounded bear, which makes enough sense being a Grizzly, which is a bear. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I think the thing you have to worry about, like any wounded animal, is they're going to lash out. I, I, I really, you know, knock on wood, I don't want to see this team hurting another star player in the NBA, and it just feels like they're that team who's just waiting to do that. I mean, it kind of feels like the Philadelphia Flyers or the Boston Bruins of the NHL, you know? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan. <laughs> Justin, Matt Barnes, I think, has made a career out of being a wounded bear. Um, is he all talk, or is he the real deal in terms of being an enforcer? He's the real deal. He drove how long to beat up Derek Fisher? Yeah. Like, that was like a two-hour trip to go punch out Derek Fisher. Uh, I I think Matt Barnes, in some ways, like he can seem like a fake tough guy at times, but he, he's done enough to make me a little bit concerned. And I don't know what Derek Fisher was doing the other day. He was posting on his Instagram pictures with Matt Barnes' uh, ex-girlfriend. Um, that's, that's welcoming a world of hurt. Uh, maybe we're going to have a new OJ documentary centered around them. That's exactly uh, what I'm after talking about. They have other guys like Zach Randolph on this team. I did. Like, okay, Zebo hasn't been that bad since the Jailblazer days, but yeah, uh, and and Lance Stevenson. Uh, I mean, um, I don't really feel comfortable joking about Lance Stevenson too much because he he did have that issue with a uh, domestic violence uh, with his uh, pregnant girlfriend a few years back, which. It's just disgusting, but yeah, there's a lot of guys with a bit of a rap sheet on the Grizzlies, which when you put that many that many volatile personalities in a locker room, it, it definitely is concerning. Um, I, I don't think it's really worth talking about kind of their long-term impact because I don't think this is something that was meant to be that. Um, it's just basically emergency replacements. Um but it's just kind of funny to see how all of these personalities ended up on one team when before the personality of the team uh, really centered around Mark Gasol, Mike Conley, and then they got their toughness from Tony Allen. They got toughness, but it's a different it's a different brand of toughness that they had in the past. Phil, going back to Lance Stevenson, uh, you know, he basically disappeared for the last two years after an emerging year with the Pacers. I think having Larry Bird around to mentor him really was a, an important piece of him as, a, as an identity, as a basketball player. And it seems like the last two weeks we've seen sparks to that again. I mean, what are you seeing from Lance lately? I mean, look, in, in his last 10 games, just pulling up some stats, he's uh, you know 16.6 .6 points, six rebounds, shooting close to 48%. This is only in 28 minutes. I, I don't think the question of talent has ever been there uh, for Lance Stevenson. I, I mean, even over the whole se even over the whole season, he's shooting good percentages. He's a good player, but like uh, referring to our um, our other uh, episode there on players going to college, like I think he's one of those guys that could have dealt with a little bit more seasoning. I I, I think I think the Larry like I think he's going to regret forever leaving Indiana. I I think Larry Bird in that situation was the one saving grace. Um, and 
I think he's going to be good just because he's that talented, but I don't know if he's ever going to land in a spot. Like, uh, like the fact that it didn't work out better with the Clippers, with Chris Paul and Doc Rivers, really worries me about his mental makeup. Well, he has been a lot better since leaving Doc Rivers, which has started to become a bit of a trend for role players. Once they, they get away from Doc Rivers, uh, they, they seem to be performing a lot better. Um I think Charlotte was a bad situation. He had a lot of injuries, so that's a that's a tough one to get a read on. But we're seeing right now that he does have some legitimate uh, ability and kind of flashing that star potential once again in Memphis. Um, I, I think Doc, his coaching isn't looking too great these days. I, I think he has regressed there. Um, I, I think he's wearing too many hats in L.A., and that's caused some friction in the locker room, and he really hasn't been able to get the most out of his role players. Um, so I'm not going to... I think there still is some career left for Lance Stevenson. Well, he's only 25, Yeah, and I have right? to mention... I have to mention that in, in here in Memphis, I mean, he's got basically a clean slate. He does a lot of isolation. You have to remember that this is the leading scorer in New York high school basketball history. So when he gets isolation one-on-one plays, he knows what to do, and he's been doing a lot of that lately. So he's in his own zone. Uh, Phil, this Grizzlies team, I think they're somewhere around fifth, fourth in the West. Do they win a series with this roster? Uh, talent, I'll say no. Um, will they injure someone, and that's how they win? <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm going to say no, just because I think they implode or get too many texts. I just... Just not a fan of this team, and I think they can be taken by a smarter team that's coached well. I think, you know, while they are tough and have a lot of uh, grit, I think skill and coaching and basketball IQ will 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 do them in. I I think what's kind of happening is they're taking advantage, kind of like Boston is in the East. Like as good as their records are showing, you know, their talent is not where their records are, and Uh. I think. Well, it, it was like the record was built with Marcus on my con. Okay, right? fair, fair. But like, like, like those guys aren't gonna come back in two seconds and be like, "Let's go!" Right? We're ready to rock, and and you guys have been practicing this whole time, and now we're one cohesive team. I mean, it's a team stumbling into the playoffs, and I think, you know, like it, they've always been a tough out, but I think. You know, I it don't might be the first round opponent of the Warriors this year. Like, I can't see Memphis really winning more than a game or two. They might fall to that eighth seed because they're sitting at 39 wins. They probably just have to win about one more game to really make the playoffs in the West. Um, they they could end up playing the Warriors first round, which which could well it's going to be ugly from a score perspective, but. I think uh, the way that uh, Golden State kind of showboats and their personalities could bring out um, the worst. It could get ugly. Yeah, Yeah, Uh, it could really bring out the worst there. I'm worried for Steph Curry. That's all I'm going to say. The Wounded Bear, the Memphis Grizzlies, to be continued. Uh, So, our fourth and final topic today, it's our running series on guys not named Kobe Bryant in the farewell tour of all these great guys from a generation of just some of the all-time great NBA players. Uh, I want to talk about one of the guys from this era who's so unheralded, he's not talked about enough, uh, the 57th pick in the 1999 draft. Manu Ginobili is by far one of the best non-American basketball players ever to grace the court. Phil, what does Manu mean to you? Um, I kind of... It, 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 it's funny because uh, whenever I talk about him, I like I think people either really get his talent or they really just think he's overrated. Um, in a lot of weird plays, I mean, I, I, I've seen comparisons of people saying, you know, who would you rather have at 20 years old if you could draft him or Dwayne Wade? And everyone's like, oh, for sure, Dwayne Wade, Dwayne Wade. But it's kind of like, look what this guy does. like, And he's been playing forever, right? Like his ability to pass, his ability to score, his ability to just kind of do everything. Um, I think he's one of the most talented players we've seen in a while. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, he even has some flash. I just think, you know, playing in a Popovich system where people pre-assume you're boring because you're a spur, um, you know, if he was allowed to be run and gun in a Lakers system or a Knicks system, I think we'd be looking at him in a whole different light. He's a, 
He's incredibly efficient. You know, for his career, he's only played 26 minutes a game, but he shoots really well, hits his free throws, assists really well. I mean, he hits four assists as an off guard playing 26 minutes a game for his career. Um, I think he's one of the better two guards to, you know, like if you have to make a list, he's going to make the top of that. Justin, is he the best six man ever? Pardon me? Is he the best six man ever? Got to be in the conversation. Um, he, he definitely, definitely has a place in that conversation. Um, it's almost not fair to call him a six man because he, he really did close out all of those games, um, playing starters minutes. Um, that always feels like one of those technical six men. Like Lamar Odom's another guy that kind of sticks out to me, although he never really realized his full potential in the same way. Um, but just absolutely a part of that core. Um, no doubt in my mind, a Hall of Fame player. And when you think of the ultimate six men, he, he's he's who pops out. Phil, what's your favorite Manu uh, memory? It doesn't have to necessarily be on an NBA court. Is it the bat? Is it killing the bat with his bare hand? <laughs> yeah. God, it kind of had to have been that. I don't know. I just feel like like he made the Euro step cool in the NBA. Yeah. He did. You know? like, and people kind of, and I think that's kind of an underrated thing when we're seeing a lot of these rookies come in these last couple of years. I don't think people are talking about this. Like, people Eurostep now, you know? Jamal and Murray does that a lot. Yeah. And, you know, for guards that don't necessarily have all of that athleticism in the world, but this guy could sky. Like, like Ginobili could really dunk. Um, I just really... Well, like, I don't want to say his haircut was the most memorable thing, because, uh, I mean, really... <laughs> the bald uh, spot. Yeah. The bald I feel like that whole Spurs terrible. team uh, could have really used a stylist and maybe, you know, for uh, Boris Dia, a weight coach. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's it. he's one of those guys that just plays with his heart on his sleeve. Like, I don't think there's many guys who you really look at and you're like, you outwork Manu Ginobili. No. Justin, yeah. you have a favorite memory? That... Oh man, it's tough because like so many of my memories were Manu and other Spurs ruining my childhood, beating the Steve Nash Suns again and again. Um, I always enjoyed it when he would just like show like a flash of athleticism that like nobody expected and like just dunk over somebody. Like that always excited me. Um, I, I guess the most lingering thing with Manu is just the fear when you would see the Spurs cycle the ball, and like before they became the offensive juggernaut that they they've become in recent years, uh, when they were that defensive team, when the ball would rotate on the perimeter and you just see it get into Manu's hands and you knew he had that open space, you just knew it was going in, especially if it was a big shot. Um, it, it's just so impressive to see somebody come off the bench have a feel for the game, which is one of the benefits of coming off the bench, and just routinely make that huge impact. Um, uh, one memory, let's go with uh, Argentina beating uh, Team USA. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that That's always going to stick out to me in my mind. Uh, one for me is uh, two years ago, this is the type of guy who's aged like a fine wine. I mean, he still is very, very poignant off the bench. And I think it was two years ago, game one in the playoffs against Golden State, uh, he was missing all night, and he got the last second three to win the game. And Pop said after the game, when talking to the media, he said, I loved it, I, I want to make him breakfast. Uh, that's the type of relationship they have. I mean, R.C. Buford found him when he was about 20 in a tournament in Australia, and R.C. said at the time, uh, he is the ult ultimate O-blank player. Both coaches on both sides uh, are staying at the second get the ball. So, you know, he can either do the most dazzling thing or the most, you know, W2TF thing, but that's the type of player he's been. And Pop has been able to not, you know, break him as a horse, but be able to put him into a system and allow him to be the artist that he is. I think a big part of Mano's game is he has that soccer mentality. Growing up playing the game, he's the type of guy who throws the ball to where he wants you to be on the court not where you are on the court. and You see a lot of that in guys like Steve Nash. Uh, yeah. I want to go backwards a bit, and uh, they talk about uh, guys like Greg Popovich and Don Nelson being innovators and being willing to take guys outside non-American players into the league 
And and Manu was one of the first biggies. I mean, when he was first drafted by the Spurs, he actually waited three seasons before even signing with them. But it really helped him and guys like Dirk helped usher in an era where today we're talking about the Giannis's and the Porzingis's and the Ben Simmons's. You really got to give a thumbs up to guys like Pop and Don Nelson saying, guess what? Not all the best basketball players on the planet are from the States. Uh, Phil, one last thought on Manu. Uh, where is he going to land all time? All time? I think uh, it's so tough because it's so contextually. And like – like considering he averaged under 30 minutes a game, like I think he's going to be one of those arguments for life. You know, it's like you don't start, you did this, but his international pull is going to pull him there. I see him as easily a top 80. I think it could be argued. I'd have to see a direct list. Um, but, I mean, for top two guards, I can see him definitely top 10, I guess, top 20 at worst. Uh, but I think top 80 is pretty safe for this guy. And Justin, what's that one lingering part of his uh, legacy that's going to live on most in the NBA? Um, I just think both Manu and Tony Parker really started um, drawing attention to how important European scouting is. Um, I think his style of play also had a huge impact on the game. We talked about the Euro step. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of players imitate that. Uh, Paul Pierce utilized it more and more as he aged. Uh, Brandon Roy, uh, even young guys like I mentioned earlier, Jamal Murray. Um, you really see the flashes of uh, Ginobili. And I think he kind of laid the groundwork for guys that might not have the typical elite NBA athleticism, he kind of put the roadmap out there for how those guys can be incredibly successful in the NBA. And um, I, I, I haven't sat down and looked where he ranks all time in uh, shooting guards, but there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to be in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Manu Ginobili, one of the all-time greats. Phil, I'm going to throw it back to you. All right, guys. Well, thank you once again for joining us here at HoopsLounge.com with myself, Phil Boileau, a.k.a. Sporting Phil, Mark Griffin, a.k.a. Montreal Mark, and Justin Rowan, a.k.a. Cavs. Anita, join us on the Twitterverse to keep this conversation going, and we'll try to bring you videos as much as we can. As much as, And, guys, tell us what you guys are really thinking of because we like getting that conversation going because that's where it all stems, right? One love, one basketball, HoopsLounge.com. Catch in the lounge. <laughs>